don't treat sales as a math equation. I hear this a lot. We close one out of every hundred. We expect to close one out of every 150. And in that, a CRM gets to be a nightmare because you're basing future results on past not so great results. And you're using those not so great results as your benchmark. The reality we should be looking at, Randy, is we should be looking at a mixture of call cadence, how often you're making them and who you're making them to, but the quality of the call. In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, super excited about the guest I'm about ready to bring to you today. This is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a conversation that is about conversation. We're going to talk about the art of using your words right through conversations to be more persuasive in the art of potentially selling or even just in just normal conversations back and back and forth with whether it's your family, your friends, your coworkers. It's really going to be a powerful conversation. So today I've got with us Jake Stahl. Jake is the founder of Jake Stahl Consulting. He is a fractional chief learning officer. We'll get into detail as far as what exactly that is. I read that for the first time and I was like, huh, that's interesting. I'm not even sure what that is. But yeah, it'll be fun. We'll get into what that is. He is revolutionizing sales through his adaptive conversational blueprint. He's the creator of the 210 rule, which emphasizes the importance of rhythm and cadence in conversation. He shared his expertise in training and development in over six countries and impacted over 10,000 individuals. So to say that he doesn't have the chops when it comes to training and helping folks in terms of conversation, sales, all that, yeah, he's got it all, which is one of the main reasons why I wanted to have him on the show. I just knew that this conversation was going to be a lot of fun. And even just before we hit record, just a little bit of a dialogue that we've had so far, I'm just super confident that we're going to have a lot of fun. So Jake, welcome to the show. Oh, Randy, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. So I went through a lot of the high level bullet points, which the first thing I always love to do when I have a guest on, if you could take as much time as you'd like, share with us your story, kind of where you've been, maybe some of the progressions. Obviously, you're now this chief uh, learning, fractional chief learning officer, right? Go for, if you go back as far as you would like and just tell everybody a little bit about yourself so we can get to know you a little better. Sure. Uh so I was raised in that generation of people, and I'm sure some of your listeners can relate, where the child is to be seen and not heard. And luckily, I had a dad who was very strong in the business community. So I sat in on a lot of business meetings over the years. And you know what? When you're younger, you just don't appreciate what you learn. Uh, but as I got older, I got into sales. Uh, I was uh, sales in four different large companies, and I was number one in three out of the four. I'm still a little angry about the fourth one. And at one point, I was asked if I wanted to go into training, if I wanted to train some other people. And I said, yeah, that, that sounds fantastic. But I don't know what I have to offer. And I had no idea how to communicate what I had to offer. So the past 30 years has been kind of dedicating to understanding the transfer of knowledge, the power of certain words and verbiage, uh, the ability to have a solid conversation that's not one-sided, but in fact thoroughly involves both people to the point where you get information from people they may not normally be willing to give, but because you've built that trust, there's an openness that tends to happen uh, that allows for a more down-to-earth conversation. So I took that, I created a product, and I've taken it out to companies. And, you know, we've had some great successes. Uh, I've seen increases of 3x in sales and customer service stars going up by one and a half points. Uh, it, it's just been a great process. But as we'll talk about, Randy, what I do isn't traditional. Uh, I'm not your standard sales trainer. And... Uh, you know, like everybody, I've had my ups and downs in life. Uh, Ten years ago, things kind of went sideways and I've had to build back up. Um, but the important thing is where we are now and what we've learned and what we're what we're doing about what we've learned. Right. Yes. So taking those skills, the bumps in the road and then applying them into new areas of life is super important. And uh, if you're not 
applying what you're learning, obviously you're going to be keep falling behind, which is where it's so important. There again, with that communication piece, not only with others, but then with communication within yourself. Yeah. And Randy, I think we kind of take this for granted. If we look back in the history of men and womankind, you know, you look back at, at the cave drawings we found. So our need to communicate and be heard and reminisce and tell a story is, is foundational to who we are. Even before language was formally developed, it was informally developed. So our need to communicate and be heard is the very foundation of who we are. So if we can improve that, if we can make it more effective, think of the dramatic changes in our personal life, our business life. Uh, there's nothing that can't improve by upping your communication skills. And honestly, it's a practice that you get to do every day. So it's nice though you don't get to rehearse it. So it's a constant, constant struggle to uh, be able to communicate better. So communication, I know that from leading my family. I used to lead small teams. I used to be a retail store manager. I think I shared that with you in our introduction. And then I moved over into working for Coca-Cola for several years as well. And so sales, communication, has been crucial in all areas of my life. And I think I even shared with you uh, in our my Coca-Cola days, I had to, there was a lot of times I was scripted to say certain things at certain times, right. right? To try to sell whatever store manager on a product or service that I was trying to provide. Yeah. But what I realized really quick was the ability to communicate, the ability to become relational. I don't know if that's the right word. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's a technical term or maybe you have a better term for it, but uh, the ability to relate with people right yeah. through the communication phase was so much more impactful for me. I had much better success when it went down that route versus here's store manager. Here's my program. Here's my little slide, you know, my bullet point, you know, we always had papers that we'd take carry around with us and we'd present them to the store managers and just expect them to buy or, <laughs> or, you know, we go for a program when in fact, they don't really care. They didn't care what we had. Or, I mean, but anyways, if I had that relationship built first, it's almost like I didn't even have to sell anything. It was, it was just a totally different experience. And Randy, you're bringing up a, a really important concept in communication is that every second we talk sets a precedent for what we're going to say next. So if I listen and I sometimes repeat things back to you and we start to develop a trust, your ability to become more receptive to my ideas does nothing but grow. And part of the reason I think salespeople struggle sometimes is they're trying to introduce a concept before that receptivity has grown between the two people. So do you have any suggestions? I know that I, I was almost like trial and error for myself, but do you, if you're working with somebody, whether it's an individual or, or an organization that they're, day-to-day -day activities is just almost scripted, right? Yeah. What are some, some tips and some ideas of about, you know, improving that conversation piece to at least get the process started as far as having a, a relationship with that person? I think one word that we can use, and it's got a tiny bit of negative connotation to it, but one word we can use is restraint. Remember what everybody's favorite topic is themselves, right? Absolutely. So, when I do reach outs to people, I don't talk about me or my product for the first three or four times we communicate. Hmm. And here's what winds up happening. Another fundamental psychological concept all humans have is that of reciprocation. So when you let somebody else talk about themselves and feel good about talking to themselves, I mean, chemists and biologists have measured, it increases neurotransmitters. It's like eating chocolate or having a surprise party thrown. When you talk about yourself, you feel good. So eventually though, Randy, you say to me, Jake, wow, I've talked a lot about me for the past 10 or 15 minutes. Tell me about you. And at that point, my message is ready to be delivered. Mm. So part of communication, Randy, is restraint in the beginning. Let that other person be who they are, enjoy who they are. And, uh, it's amazing the way the conversation turns if you just take those few minutes to do that. My father, and it, he, 
he's taught me that as far as the me, the person, right? The, the most important person in the other person's life is them, period. Yep. He taught me that. And then I, I, did, I worded that completely in, inaccurate. But at the same time, it's kind of the same thing of what you were just saying. Yeah. But then one thing he always taught me, and I'm curious, is to lead in with questions versus telling Versus like, for example, if I met someone and I had a potential to sell them on something, or if I had it, if I was wanting to encourage them to move forward with a product or service, finding out about their family, finding out about them, what they need, what they like through questions, I would assume that that is very important part of that process. Is that part of the, the program for yourself? Is that kind of what you help people do? Yeah. And, you know, it can be asking questions or it can be just the simple task of repeating back something they said just in a different way. So if I'm talking to somebody and they say, yeah, listen, I'd, I'd love to buy your health benefits package, but I'm just not in the market. So it's easy enough to just say back so you don't feel it's a good market right now and just let them expand on it. And what's funny, Randy, is when I coach people privately on this, they always say, oh, people are going to know. They're going to know I'm parroting things back. I have never, ever in any conversation had somebody say to me, why are you just repeating what I say? In fact, it's the exact opposite. It elicits information and it gets them to open up more. So your dad was dead on. Questions are great, but questions for the sake of questions can get some people in, in trouble. It should be genuine interest authentic caring, and the, the true desire to know more and get to the root of things. And if, if I can give you an example real quick. Please. We always hear ads on TV. Want to lose weight? It's time to lose weight. It's summertime. Are you ready to lose weight? Randy, I would argue nobody on the planet has ever, ever wanted to lose weight, ever. What they did want is to take pressure off their knees, make their back feel better look better for their significant other in a swimsuit, fit into the college swimsuit that they had, look better on the scale. But that's not what people address. They say, do you want to lose weight? Hey, I have this supplement that'll do it. When in reality, they should be saying, hey, want to bounce your granddaughter on your knee without hurting anymore? Here's a supplement that can help you do that. There's the old adage that you never buy a drill bit, you buy the hole. I would argue it goes further than that. You don't just mm -hmm. buy the whole, you buy the ambience of the room that that picture is now hanging in. So when okay. you sell the overall end result, you're much more likely to get that. And questions is a way for me to get there. I always follow a three-step rule. I like to try and understand why three different times. So, hey, Jake, I was looking to lose weight. Oh, it doesn't look like you need to lose weight. Yeah, you know, I've been having some problems. Oh, problems? Yeah, you know, my back's really hurting. You look awfully young for your back to hurt. Yeah, it's really only when I when I bend over. So now I know it's not to lose weight. Your back hurts when you bend over and you're hoping that's the solution. But all I did re was repeat things back. So to your dad's point, ask a question, but also don't hesitate just to feed back what they're telling you. A lot of reflection back to them. So yeah. let me reflect back to you a little bit with what you just said, because that was something that that whole analogy uh, is something that I actually had an episode on a month ago or so, because when I first heard that from a marketing standpoint, right? So marketing and sales to me kind of, they're not same, but at the same time, they kind of go hand in hand. But the idea of selling the benefit versus a feature, right? And so that kind of goes in with the emotion. So the people right. aren't there to... to I love that idea. So that it even you took it further. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to add that to my, to my way of thinking, <laughs> but yes, the whole idea that people don't go to the hardware store to buy a drill, they go to the hardware store to buy a drill because they need a hole. Right. And at the first time I ever heard that, it was like, that was like a, that, was, that blew my mind. I didn't, I didn't know how to take that when I first heard that. But so then for you to take that the next step and it's like, no, they don't want the hole. They want the ambiance in the room to make, that's going to make them feel better. So right. if you can dig deep through your communication, that's how you can get there in the course of uh, whether it's a sales conversation or definitely a persuasive conversation for sure. Yeah. And, and you could even dig it deeper a little bit. Some people don't like pictures of themselves, so they may want to lose weight to buy a selfie. 
right? They want to they wanna buy the best selfie they ever took. And it's incumbent upon us as business people to understand how our product fulfills that, let's call it a dream outcome. So how can we satisfy that dream outcome? So the sales process or, or when we develop our business product to get to the end user is we should be building it around the dream outcome. And even more importantly, what's that person's perception of the dream outcome? Because you never sell to reality, you sell to perception. Hundred percent. So the question that's coming to my mind, you're, I assume most of your communication, as far as what you teach, is one-on-one, face-to-face, verbal. Do you have any type of thoughts as far as written copy and that type of thing? It, a lot of that kind of goes the same way, right? Being able to persuade or talk in a an emotional sense in a written form is that similar? Does that go right along with the things that you teach? It is very similar, and I do both individual clients and corporations with this this product. Um, But to answer your question, when you put it in writing, it adds a new wrinkle. And I'm going to give a concept and I'm going to see if you ever thought about this way before. I would argue, Randy, that nobody writes their own email or text ever. The person that writes it is the person that's reading it because they write it from their viewpoint, from the day they had, from words that trigger them from the mood that they're in, from whether they even want to get a message from you or not, or even if they even want to read it. So they are writing your email or text in their head. So one thing I always advise clients is if you have something that is other than, let's say, an instruction guide or bulleted instructions that people will benefit from having it written down, make it much shorter copy and make part of your reach out getting in touch with them live. It helps eliminate or dramatically reduce misunderstandings. And again, I would argue this is an issue with social media. You can have somebody putting out a perfectly benign message and being read in a completely different way by tens of thousands of people. So putting something in writing adds a wrinkle that you definitely need to account for. I love that. I say a lot of times, especially around my family, that the written communication is, it's taken for granted in my opinion, meaning it's its terrible. Text messaging, in my opinion, is like the worst form of communication ever known to man because it can, things can be interpreted so many different ways. Text messages is just, just short form content. Emails even sometimes can be very difficult as well. I loved how you went there and shared that. Try to get people off of the written form and back into a verbal communication is key if you're trying to uh, persuade or move them into a sales conversation. That's, that's, that's very good. And not only that, Randy, but you also have the generational wrinkle, right? So Mm -hmm. you have baby boomers who prefer to be communicated with in one way. You have Gen Xers who like another way. You have Gen Yers, you have millennials. All of them have their own preferred method. A baby boomer or a Gen Xer would probably like a phone call. A millennial may take that as aggressive. So I think that's kind of a piece we tend to miss too when it comes to marketing or selling is that if we have a scripted message, by nature, that is just going to apply to only a small percentage of your population. So that's why to me, crafting the perfect conversation is far better than using a sales script because the sales script is eliminating a huge portion of your audience just by the very nature of the fact that it may not apply to those people. Of course, that's where, like you said, the generational, it's, it's so important to understand who you're speaking to. So if you're going into a sales conversation with someone and you've chosen the mode, the modality, whether it's text at first or if it's a phone call or whatever, how much time and effort do you recommend to spend, like you said, getting to the core feeling of what that end user is looking for? How How long do you spend on it? And then what are the best practices to kind of get that information? Do you have any suggestions for something like that? Yeah, it's it's going to depend on the customer. It's going to depend on the day they're having. It's going to depend on your opening. Like I have a pet peeve against people who open with how are you? That's probably a whole different topic. Uh, But it, it largely depends on the people that you talk to. But here's one thing that is universal. Uh, I have certifications in neurolinguistic programming. And what that teaches you is that everybody has a, a modality of the way they think about things or communicate things. 
and the vast majority of people are visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And if you listen, it's not hard to pick that up. And if you then start to communicate back with them in their modality, you start to build a bond. And if you can mirror some of their motions, that builds the bond further. Psychologists have even shown that with a Zoom picture, you can take a Zoom picture a certain way to start to establish trust. There's three pieces to a trusting Zoom picture. So everything we do factors into how that person's going to receive us. And honestly, sales is a tough job. People who do it right, it's mentally taxing because you're trying to be that chameleon and adapt the whole time. But so all that being said, figure out the person's modality, model what they're doing, and don't hesitate to use the language that they use and ask further questions. Because here's the amazing thing, Randy, is if you and I talk and we enjoy the conversation, you don't ever think we had a great conversation. You think I liked talking to Jake. So mm. you associate that good feeling with talking to me. So the next time I call you, you're like, oh, Jake, yeah, that's, he talks about me and he listens and, and he's really interested. So I'm going to pick up the phone. And on the flip side of that is those phone calls you get where you look at the caller ID and you think, oh my God, I just do not have time for this person. And we've all been there, right? I'm sure everybody in the audience is thinking of a person right now in their head. And when that number comes up, they just think, pass. Yes, just pass it on. And that's where the technology these days, right? You almost get instant, tells you whether it's going to be a spam call or not, right? It already yeah, right? gives you an idea of what to expect versus back in the day. I can remember before all the technology and those types of things that you had to answer the phone to see who was going to be on the other side. Yeah. My dad getting so mad sometimes when a phone solicitor was calling. It, yeah. Anyways, that's a whole nother, a whole nother topic, but yeah. <laughs> that could be a great episode help. though. I'd love to hear oh, those stories. Man. <laughs> if we could just go back and talk about the analog days versus the digital days, man, that yeah, would be right? content for days. It, those of us who lived through that, that's for sure. So that's super cool. So let's pivot a little bit. Let's talk yeah. about your your fractional chief learning officer. Yeah. Just can you go into a little bit of detail? What exactly is that? I'm just curious, even for myself. I I'm familiar with C-suite level offices, right, within an yeah. organization or corporation. But I'm just curious about about your title there for yourself. Yeah. So let's kind of split that in half. Right now, there's a big movement taking off around the world, and it's growing exponentially. It's called the fractional movement. And fractional basically means you step into the a C-suite position of a company and you step in as a certain role. In my case, it's, a, it's the chief learning officer. And you step in for a fraction of the time. In other words, you may only need me 20 hours a month to get something up and running or help your training department get off the ground or to build a sales program. And you may only need me for a couple of months but you're getting it at a fraction of the price because to hire me full time is a lot of money, but to get fractions of my time, you're still going to get the same quality service and you're going to get it at a fraction of the cost. And honestly, when you think about a lot of executives, when they're first starting off, they're really just honing the program. They're really just getting things started. So you may not need them the full time. So the fractional movement is basically says, hey, if you're a startup or a small business and you can't afford to hire a head of training and development, why not get a world-class trainer to come in only for the hours you need them? That's it. And when you don't need them anymore, they'd help you build a department, then you can just walk away. So the fractional movement is very appealing in a lot of different, a lot of different ways for that. The CLO part, the chief learning officer part, is merely a fluffy way to set, say head of training and development. So my job is to come in, I help people set up their training department, or I train their sales staff, or I build them a sales department and I get it up and running and selling effectively. But as a fractional CLO, you can get a fractional chief marketing officer. I've seen mm -hmm. companies hire fractional CEOs, somebody to fill the spot until they can find a full timer but you're getting world-class people for a fraction of what you'd pay them if they were with you as a full-timer. Hence the name fractional, which makes total Hence sense. I'm glad you clarified. Yeah. Definitely glad you clarified. So let's assume 
that we're having some folks that maybe they're in an organization or they have an organization, whether it's a startup or something like that. And they're listening and they're like, yeah, maybe they're not hundred percent familiar with that term or the fractional part of, of hiring, like you said, a world-class person to help them with their training. Walk us through kind of what that looks like. If they're meaning you get contacted, I assume they would bring you in. So that's where I don't want to assume. I want you to tell me yeah. as far as they bring you in to meet the, the organization you figure out what the what's missing. Just curious on kind of the process. If if they as they realize that they need someone with the skill set of your like yourself to learn and teach the art of sales to the organization, kind of walk us through what that process looks like. Sure. So I'm not much different than other fractionals in that usually as a fractional, we'll give a half an hour or an hour consult to start. So it's kind of a feel each other out thing. You like me, you don't like me, we can work together, we can't work together. So it's almost like a just an hour trial run. And it also gives me the opportunity to see where you are. Do you have a sales team? Have they been performing? Are they not performing? What's that look like compared to your demographics? So we can walk through that entire process. And then usually what I'll do is I will say to them, so what's your goals in this whole thing? Where do we want to be? What do you want your sales to be? I assess how realistic that is because I can tell you sometimes the requests are, you know, I want my whole sales staff trained and producing at 300% within a week and a half. And that's just not going to work out. So we get what your goals are. And then what I do is I tell them what kind of time that would take, what kind of end results I could provide for them. And, and I create the collateral. And usually it includes an onboarding program. Because the number one reason people, salespeople leave in the first six months is that they weren't trained well. They, they feel like they failed and they were set up to fail. So uh, I've set up onboarding programs for many companies over the years to help people become successful quicker. I'm not sure if you know this, Randy, but it seems like the average amount a company pays just to get a sales rep to walk through the door is about 18,000. If you factor in everything, time spent, intangibles, tangibles, et cetera. So, you want to get an ROI on that 18000 really quick. You want to get that money back. So that's what the onboarding does. It helps you get that person upskilled quickly and moving along. And then the sales program that, that companies roll out with me usually is, is the uh, what happens when you pick up the phone? How do I work from there? Love that. And yes, I was familiar with that That. That figure, we, once again, back in my Coca-Cola days, we would talk about that, right? And how important yeah. that was to make sure that the staff, when they were being brought in, was up to speed as quickly as humanly possible, even though some of the tactics obviously were not uh, always proper or best, maybe for execution out there in the sales force. So, but anyways, that's fantastic. So can you describe kind of maybe a, from maybe a size of business, right? As far as like the process, as far as how quickly they can potentially start seeing results. I, I know I've seen you, I've said that you've gotten, you know, three X results as far as three times, you know, in sales, but as far as the time frame, how to, how long does it typically take for somebody to, depending on size, I'm sure, and the amount of people, but yeah, yeah. I'm just curious on what, when they could start seeing some results. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. The first scenario is you've already got a staff in place that is already producing good or bad, and they're open to change. In those scenarios, we can upskill pretty quickly. We can do six to eight months and, and we can see results. The flip side of that coin is I've gone into companies where they hired salespeople just to fill seats and just to try to produce revenue. And at that point, we may need to do a do-over. We may need to take, may need to take a mulligan and just say, we're going to clean the house and we're going to start again. And that can take up to a year and a half. So it all depends on what you walk into. And I would say a vast majority of companies typically have hired well. They just aren't sure how to get people upskilled to where they need to be. So oftentimes I can just come in and help them revamp a program. It's rare that we go in and, and say, this, there is nothing about this that works. And we have to start over again. And that's all part of the hour process. Because if I'm talking with a business owner, they may say, Jake, I, I just, I can't afford to just cut everybody and start over again. 
And maybe that's a situation where I can get you in touch with the chief revenue officer and they can build you a sales force because that's honestly not my wheelhouse. Um, but yeah, so the one hour conversation either leads to me helping you or leads me to getting you in touch with someone who can help you. So there's no signing of a contract. And even fractionally, I can tell you, I work with people a month at a time. So if after mm -hmm. a month we find it's not working, that's okay. We'll part ways and we'll do what we need to do. But I'm not looking to lock anybody into anything. This is about building you and growing in your satisfaction. Love that. That's, that's super cool. That's super cool. So we've gone through the process. We've talked yep. about what conversations are. We've talked about the kind of businesses that you work with, but let's go into a little bit of a detail about the adaptive conversational blueprint that you have. That uh, is probably what you bring, depending on what the organization is actually needing. Can you go into a little bit of detail as far as what that is? Is there any kind of high level bullet points that you might be able to share with us to add some value? Sure. So one of the things about the companies that I work for is I get to question a lot, what vertical do you like to work in? Is there any specific industry? And the beautiful thing about sales is that everybody psychologically, for the most part, works the same. The only thing that really changes is the product, uh, the sales cycle, and the price tag. So the Adaptive Conversational Blueprint basically shows you that instead of doing a sales script, instead of having something you use as a one-size-fits-all, I teach people how to adapt from the very first second on the phone. So we talk about how to do a better greeting instead of, hi, how are you? And if you put a pin in that, Randy, I'll come back and give companies some ideas. Once you get past that phase, then how do you read a person? How do you get a good feel for who and what they are in 30 seconds to a minute? So we walk through that. I teach all companies about psychology, about neurolinguistic programming and how to read people. And not only that, but how to communicate based on their style. We talk a lot about localization of a message. So if I'm a New Yorker selling to another New Yorker, that's going to be a lot different than if I'm a New Yorker selling to somebody in Savannah, Georgia. So we teach people how to localize a message and appeal to uh, even their own vocabulary because voc vocabularies can be different. And what we found is that if we can get somebody to adapt to a person on the other end of the phone, the trust builds 10 times quicker. And sometimes it happens within minutes and you start to build a relationship and people buy based on relationships. So I always tell customers when I talk to them, I don't teach your people how to sell. I teach them how to have the perfect conversation and that leads to a sale. And in my mind, Randy, there's a huge difference. I would agree for sure. A big difference. So you made reference there that the idea of uh, the question, or as far as the initial statement of, hi, how are you, is not necessarily the best way to get started. I, I have a feeling you've got some, some suggestions of a better yeah. way to start that conversation. So I'm definitely going to give you one pearl. Uh, I'll give you a quick context on this. So my wife and I went out shopping uh, a couple of months ago, and I walked by another gentleman, and he looked at me, and we nodded heads, and I said, hey. And he said, fine, thanks. How are you? So that conversation took place in his head, even though it didn't take place verbally. And it shows you something really remarkable. We're conditioned to respond certain ways to certain stimulus and hi, how are you? Unless you're talking to a family member, let's all be real. We really don't care. If I'd walked by a stranger and I said, hi, how are you? And they went into a 20 minute diatribe, I'm not sure how I'd react. So my suggestion is if you have a salesperson making a call or if you're a business owner making a call, don't start with how are you? Do some research into them and maybe I would start this way. Hey, Randy, I am so glad you picked up the phone. Man, I watched your podcast and I was thrilled. I, I literally can't wait to hear more about it. Tell me what's going on. Think about that versus, hey, Randy, it's Jake Stahl from Jake Stahl Consulting. How are you? I broke through your conditioning and I put you on uh, a, a track of we're going to have a great conversation because he wants to hear about me. And in this day and age, Randy, of the web and how much research you can do on somebody, there's no excuse not to do that research before you call somebody and then greet them with the best greeting they can imagine. 
Love that. So then the, the question that's come to my mind as you're explaining that is, is the, is there importance? It's more of a question of the pause, almost the, you get your greeting in, but as far as just sitting there long enough, even if it's a little bit awkward and letting that conversation kind of develop, how important is that part of the process? It's super crucial. And Randy, you hit on something so cool. You said sometimes it, it can be awkward. They actually did studies on this and they found that Americans are very, very unsettled by a pause up to four seconds. In contrast, our Japanese counterparts use silence up to eight seconds in a conversation intentionally to show respect and to get more from the other person. So culturally, we struggle with silence. And if you talk to psychologists, some of them will say that silence uh, really kind of triggers a fight or flight syndrome. We're like, oh my God, there's silence. Something must be going on. I got to fill the air. I even have a different colleague of mine who said that we're all in, uh, we're all either sinning or asking for forgiveness. And the sin is throwing out your message without, you know, with blatant disregard for what they're thinking. And the asking for forgiveness is the pausing and asking them a question and giving consolations in your pricing. So silence is super crucial. And part of the conversation, Randy, gives you time to think and it gives you time to slow down. There could be books written about silence if, if you want to be truthful about it. So powerful. <laughs> the book of nothing. It's right. silence. <laughs> 120 blind pages. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But how important it actually is in a conversation, right? Which is exactly right. what we're trying to talk about today. So if you're working with a, whether it's a, a newer individual or, you know I mean? A young organization, let's say, can you think of maybe the top two or three most important things that you see kind of most common as far as traits or habits that they've gotten themselves in? Uh, let's say that they're trying to move away from the script but just can you come up with a couple, two or three things, like the most important uh, that people can take away with today if they're in a sales conversation with somebody that they can use right away? Yeah, so part of that is my 210 rule. And uh, I recently just co-authored a book with 24 other authors and I put in a chapter about the 210 rule. It's a theory I've had over the years that's kind of borne itself out. And it's that for every 10 minutes you talk, you generate approximately two minutes worth of questions in somebody else. So it's an approximate. There's no science behind that. It's something I've found to be remarkably true over the years. So if you think about in the context of, let's say you're at a presentation and in the first 10 minutes you have a question and you know it's not going to get answered, what's the only thing that sits on your brain? It's that question, right? It eats away at you. So I kind of turned that on its head and I said, so what if I create an interaction with you every two minutes? I make sure you're following along. I ask if everything's clear. I repeat back something you say. I get you to ask a question. If every two minutes I can create an interaction and then at the end of every 10 minutes, I sum it all up. So Randy, man, I've been blabbing for 10 minutes now. Sure, you're bored. Any questions I've generated in your head that, that may be bugging you? So if I check in every two minutes and then round it out every 10 minutes, think about how different our messaging would be and the clarity would be. And I'm going to ask the question you probably have in your head. Yes, when I've taught some people this, we've used a stopwatch. Mm. And it doesn't take long to reprogram yourself, but you have to be open to it. And so we talk through a lot of techniques of repeating back, asking the right question, how to create those two minute interactions. So my advice to people is develop a cadence in the conversation. Every two minutes, try and check in. Every 10 minutes, summarize what you said and ask for any questions. You do that, man, it, it changes everything. I've turned around entire sales teams just by doing this alone, not changing anything else, just changing that. That's super cool. So I love that. Uh, so then the thought that I've got in my mind is it's almost like you said you did a stopwatch. You're right. I was wondering, do we actually yeah. count and try to keep track of the 10 minutes? Right. But yeah. then the idea of, so 
one thing I always like to talk about on the, on the podcast is just the, the internal dialogue that's going on in our own minds all the time. So if you're yeah. the person that's, let's, let's call it in control of the conversation, meaning you're initiating the conversation. Yep. Do you have any suggestions on for people to keep, keep the, the, the conversation that's like not productive, I guess you see what I'm saying? If how they yeah. can stay present enough to, to notice and pay attention to this two ten rule versus yeah getting ahead of themselves, right? Interrupting. Does that make sense where I'm kind of going with yeah. that question? No, Do you have it any makes perfect sense. On that? And let's take a step back just for a second because I want to answer a question I think probably a lot of people have in their heads. And that question is, does it have to be two minutes and 10 minutes? Worth? What if it's just a five minute call? The two minutes and 10 minutes just kind of put a police tape around the longest you should wait to do an interaction. For all I care, it could be a 20-second, two-minute rule or a 30-second, five-minute rule. It doesn't really matter. It's just the cadence that matters. So now to get to the question that you had, Randy, what's cool about this is when you do this and you have to think about how you're going to create an interaction, you don't have time for the other thoughts in your head. The hard part mm. about this is getting people to understand that the other person will feed you everything you need to know. They will, I promise. It, it, it happens every time, 100% of the time. So we don't have to think about what we're going to say because the way we're eliciting information is going to get them to tell us what we need. And the questions will continue to come naturally. So whether I ask it now or ask it in 10 minutes is super relevant because... Remember what we said earlier is we're always setting a precedent for the time to come. So I want to ask a question or I want to make a statement when it's going to have the most possible impact. And the two minute, two ten rule really allows you to ferret that out. I, I can tell you, Randy, it's a miracle worker. I've done this all over the world. And if people take the two ten rule seriously, it changes the way they communicate. So I love that. I'm going to see if I can't get you to go a little bit deeper as far as even just give us like an example. And it doesn't have to be maybe be something specific, but can you kind of walk us through a, a conversation? Um, obviously, it's going to be a little bit of a hypothetical conversation, but at the same yeah. time, can you give us an example of how to use it effectively? You kind of touched a few points there, but I just would love for you to go a little bit deeper on that. Because I, like you said, I think that if people can catch that, catch that pass, right? I think that it can be super powerful in terms of them being more effective out there in, in the marketplace. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to give kind of two sides of a conversation. So I'll do my best to not confuse people, but let's say you're selling an intangible, like a benefits package, maybe health benefits. So if I start on a conversation with people and I've already given my entrance, man, I couldn't wait to talk to you. Thanks for picking up the phone. Really want to talk to your company because X. And the person goes, so Jake, what are you selling? So I appreciate you asking, but I think you know what time of year this is, right? You're probably entertaining the thoughts of changing your health plan. Yes, we really are. So you really hate this time of year, right? Yeah, I really do. I don't even like talking to people like you. I get it. You don't like what I call. And they're like, no, I don't, because all you're going to do is you're going to slap me with a heavy price tag. And then later on, you're just going to let me down because your promises aren't being fulfilled. Your promises aren't being fulfilled? Yeah. In the past, I've had people not do A, B, and C when they say they were going to. Wow, I'll bet that was tough. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. And I'm not going to take that from you either, because what I want is I want A, B, and C. So... Which is more important? Is it the A, B, and C, or do they all have equal weight? So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of repeating back, and I'm relating and empathizing with their plight. And what that does is it not only eases them, but it makes them more willing to open up. And honestly, Randy, if you want to complain with me on the phone, I'll listen all day long, because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be telling me exactly what you need. And then I know whether my product is going to fit uh, what your needs are or not. And if they're not, I'll hang up. But if they are, I definitely want to walk you through how we can fill that process. But my goal is with the 210 rule is just to do that steady cadence, just back and forth, get them to keep giving me information, even an objection. And here's another great hint. If somebody gives you an objection, Turn it into a question. 
So Randy, I'd love to do that, but the price is too high. What are they really saying? They're saying, Randy, can you do something a little bit better on the price tag? Boy, Randy, that contract's too long. So what are they saying? Randy, is there like a short-term thing we could do so I could do a try and buy? Every objection is a question. All we need to do as salespeople is understand what that question is, elicit more information to dig deeper, and then address it. The problem is we get so involved with scripts and knowing an immediate comeback for an objection that we don't take the time to dig. If I could eliminate one thing from every sales program on the planet, it would be objection handling. Hmm. Because it, it's, we tend to can it. And what we should really be doing is just listening and relating and letting it be part of the process. But instead we dig into it and we make it this nightmare that it doesn't have to be. Love that too. So when you're working with organizations, is it more of a, are there role playing? Like, are you working with other people to kind of, so I'm just imagining once again, I'm going back to my, my days back, back at Coca-Cola, yeah, sure. right? Yep. And we would sit across the room and pitch right? Or, or have the conversations and that kind of thing. That's kind of what I'm, I'm visioning in my mind yeah. when you're going through your training process. Is that similar? Do you help have, have people kind of, it's like you ran us through a, a hypothetical little conversation there, which was fantastic. I appreciate you going there, but when you're working one-on-one -on -one or even with a group of individuals, are you doing that role-playing situation? I would assume that probably help, is helpful. Yeah. We start with a training program that typically goes around eight weeks and then once we do that, during that time, I give homework assignments. So this week we're covering perception. So for the next week until our next class, I want you to listen for A, B, C, and D and take notes. So mm -hmm. each time I give a class, I just want them to heighten one sense. Because I think the problem we tend to run into is we give like this eight hour seminar and at the end of the seminar, everybody's supposed to know everything. I believe in more of a drip feed. We have an hour or two class, and then I let you go practice it. And next week we come back and build on what you learned. So after that eight weeks, we start getting on the phones. We're doing a lot, a lot of role playing during that time. And then most companies have some sort of call monitoring service. They use a gong or a sales loft or even a, a fathom note taker. And then we give feedback based on that. So here's what they said. Let's talk about a different direction we could have gone. So we take it from hypothetical to practice to real life, and then we reinforce. Because the overall goal objection of training is not to disseminate knowledge, it's to increase proficiency. And proficiency mm -hmm. is through practice and making mistakes and going back and refining and honing. I get asked more often than I can count, Jake, you teach communication skills all the time. Are you any good at it? No, not really. <laughs> I make mistakes every day. And then I sure. regroup the next day and I try not to make them again. So it's, it's a work in progress for everybody. The whole idea is how conscious do you become of the process and how well can you refine it? And that's where I try and step in is, is I help with refining. Love that too. That's where I knew this conversation was going to be a lot of fun. So as we begin to start bringing this one in for a close, I would love to kind of open the floor. You've shared a ton of wisdom with us here today in terms of communication, sales, just the processes, those kinds of things. Is there anything else that you can think of that would be beneficial to the listeners thinking or assuming that, you know, they, they're maybe they're early on in their, their sales careers or they're early entrepreneurs or they're even part of a startup, right? That they're trying to figure all these kinds of things out. Can you think of a, a nugget of one more nugget of wisdom that you can share with them that helped them along with this process with communication? Yeah. Don't treat sales as a math equation. I hear this a lot. We close one out of every hundred. We expect to close one out of every, every 150. And in that, a CRM gets to be a nightmare because you're basing future results on past not so great results, and you're using those not so great results as your benchmark. The reality we should be looking at, Randy, is we should be looking at a mixture of call cadence, how often you're making them and who you're making them to, but the quality of the call and making a metric somewhere in between. When we make sales a math equation, we set ourselves up for failure. And we make people want to call quicker and quicker to get those 50 calls in. So you get that one stroke of luck call. And I would say this for business owners too. Everybody's a potential buyer. 
everybody's a potential buyer. It's just a matter of finding that group and refining your message so that they want to become that buyer. Think back through history. We've sold mood rings and pet rocks. And, you know, I'm amazed at some of the stuff we buy. And pizza places. There's new pizza places opening up constantly, even though there's others. So it's not about the frequency with which you reach out. It's the quality of the reach out to the right audience. So that is kind of my my parting word. Sales is not a math equation. Quality over quantity. I love it. That's kind of my synopsis of what you just shared there. That's that's super, super impactful. So as I mentioned, Jake, this I knew this was going to be a fantastic conversation. If there's folks out there, and I know they are, they're listening, they're like, okay, I need to get Jake on my team. I need to figure out how to get a man with his experience and his capabilities to help my sales team or even myself individually to get to that performance level that we've been talking about on this conversation today. Where are the best places for people to learn more about what you have to offer? You mentioned about the book with your chapter of the 210 rule in it. Give everybody the lowdown as far as where's the best place for people to learn more about you. Sure. If they want to learn more about the 210 rule, I spell it out pretty well in a book called The Life Coach's Toolkit, Volume 2. Can I show you like a picture of it? Sure you can. So it's out on Amazon Press. Uh, It's chapter 23. It gives you more of a peek into the 210 rule. But if you want to reach me live, uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as Jake Stahl. I have a website, jakestallconsulting.com. And God willing, at, uh, in the summer, early fall, I'll be putting out a book called In Search of the Perfect Conversation. Nice. Looking forward to hearing more about that. That sounds interesting. Thank as you. I shared with you before we even hopped on, just the art of communication. I just think it's so important. We kind of touched on the text communication and how challenging that can be sometimes and all the different things that we've covered. I just knew that this was going to be a super fun conversation. We'll make sure to link up all of the things that you mentioned, uh, your different social media handles, uh, the book. Hopefully we can get a a link maybe to people, direct people to the, the book. So that way they can take a look at that chapter as well. We'll make sure we get all that in there for you. Perfect. Randy, thank you for having me again. It was much appreciated. Yes, this has been a lot of fun. So folks, if you are in some type of an organization, whether it's big or small, it sounds like Jake can have you moving very rapidly, depending on where your your needs are, right? It's really bases it based on where you're at as an organization, and it can help you grow faster than you can ever imagine trying to do it on your own. So the communication piece, as we talked about this entire episode, is so crucial that if you get it right, I love that last words of advice, the quality versus quantity. That's kind of where I just kind of chunked it down into just those two words. I love it how he left us with that idea at the end of the conversation, because I think that if you can focus on that and then get really good at the quality, then you can really start seeing some fantastic results for yourself and for your organization, which is exactly what we're all trying to do, right? Help people, help people, helping people, which is super cool. So folks, go out there, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back again with another episode and the next guest very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.